Uh, good morning, everybody. It has been several weeks, hasn't it, since uh, even several months since we've met this way remotely. Um, I'm not much of a weather man. It isn't raining outside, but it sure looked like it was going to. So I will take the blame for that one. Uh, but glad we could uh, assemble at least in this way and, and study a little bit together uh, for for uh, Lancaster people. There is a communion video up on the Facebook site and uh, some songs for your worship with your family. And then hopefully you can benefit from this, this lesson as well. But uh, good to be with you. We're going to be studying from Genesis chapter 21 in our lesson. And uh, I'm going to open there. We will read some in that text a little bit. In, in my senior year of high school, I had an English teacher, a really good English teacher. Uh, her name was Mrs. T, at least that's what we called her. And she was one of those teachers that really demanded a lot. Uh, but all along, you got the feeling that you were learning things that would benefit you. You know, there were some classes you took in high school, you wonder, when am I ever going to use this? But that wasn't the case with Mrs. T's English class. And uh, she was a lot of fun, too. She made, she made the class fun. Everybody loved Mrs. T. She had a funny way of referring to people who, let's say, misused the English language. Uh, and that, of course, was very often her own students. She would call us Philistines. And the implication, of course, was that we were sort of um, uncultured swine, you might say. But she said it with a smile, so I guess it was, wasn't offensive. Now, the Philistines were originally a, a group that lived along the coast of Canaan um, during biblical times. The Bible never describes them in the way that she used that word or that we sort of use it today as ignorant or uncultured. The Bible never depicts them that way. Uh, in fact, in more recent years, archaeologists have studied Ph Philistine culture, where they came from and so forth, and they certainly weren't ignorant or uncultured. They produced beautiful art and, and different things. Uh, but the Bible depicts them as pagans, you know, worshipers of idols and always as opponents of the people of God. And, um, you know, one of the very first times Philistines are mentioned is in Genesis chapter 21. And in the very last verse of that chapter, verse 34, the text says this, And Abraham sojourned many days in the land of of the Philistines. Now, Abraham, of course, was a man of God. And, uh, you know, he's been described in a lot of ways. He's described as the father of the faithful. Scripture calls him the friend of God, James chapter 2, verse 23. He is one of the few biblical characters that is revered by all three major world faiths, uh, Christianity, Judaism and Islam. Uh, I don't know of anything else that unites those three religions, but they all revere Abraham. They sort of look, look at him as the father of their faith. Uh, he's praised in the New Testament. Uh, his faith is upheld as a great example in Hebrews chapter 11, among other places. And so Abraham is an important biblical character. And today I want us to see one of the great aspects of Abraham's faith, and that is the way that he lived amongst the people of the world. Uh, Abraham had been promised by God that he would make of him a great nation. And uh, he believed that promise, and, and it was, you know, reckoned uh, to him as righteousness, as Scripture says in the New Testament. But, but that promise really wasn't to be realized in his lifetime. Um, for the most part, in his lifetime, Abraham was a sojourner, traveler, a wanderer. 
And for the most part, he lived in areas that were owned by others. He was usually in a minority, uh, especially when it came to the way he believed in his faith. Few of the people that surrounded him believed the way he believed. So he lived among the pagans, but he did so in a way that was godly and was really influential. And I think we can learn a lot about how we should live in our time and in our place. Galatians chapter 3 verse 7 calls us children of Abraham. And that's worth reflecting on and, and learning what it means. What does it mean to be a child of Abraham today? Well, Abraham lived in an environment that was hostile to his beliefs. And I would say, and I'm sure we'd all say, so do we. Um, but with Abraham, you, we, we never really find him bemoaning that fact that he lived in an environment hostile to, to what he believed. You never find him just sort of cursing the darkness, crying the blues about his situation. And sometimes I hear that from believers today, and I'm sure I'm guilty of it at times too. You know, we can be really good at listing all the ills of society. You know, and, and all the ways that it has fallen morally and ethically and, and so on. And it certainly has, and we're surrounded by it. It's quite evident. But after we have done that, then what? You see, that is not where it ends. You know, um, I think about Jesus. Jesus, when he prayed for his disciples, that great prayer, John chapter 17, the night before he, uh, he goes to the cross. When he prayed that intercessory prayer for his disciples, he did not pray that God would take them out of this world, this threatening world. Uh, sometimes people call it this low land of sin and sorrow. Um, no, it, that's not what Jesus prayed. Jesus actually prayed this. John chapter 17, verse 15, he said, I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. See the difference? Jesus left his followers in the world to be salt and to be light, to be a spiritual influence, to teach and evangelize. And you really can't do that if all you do is curse the darkness and cry the blues. And so Abraham, he, he knew that and he lived it. Not, I'd like us to read a story from his life that's recorded in Genesis chapter 21. And then notice a couple of things from it for our lesson today. Let's just listen to these these words that are recorded in 21st chapter of Genesis, beginning at verse 22. It says, at that time, Abraham, excuse me, at that time, Abimelech and Phicol, the commander of his army, said to Abraham, God is with you in all that you do. Now, therefore, swear to me here by God that you will not deal falsely with me or with my descendants or with my posterity. But as I have dealt with you kindly, so you will deal with me and with the land where you have sojourned. And Abraham said, I will swear. When Abraham reproved Abimelech about a well of water that Abimelech's servants had seized, Abimelech said, I do not know who has done this thing. You did not tell me, and I have not heard of it until today. So Abraham took sheep and oxen and gave them to Abimelech, and the two men made a covenant. Abraham set seven ewe lambs of the flock apart. And Abimelech said to Abraham, What is the meaning of these seven ewe lambs that you have set apart? He said, These seven ewe lambs you will take from my hand 
that this may be a witness for me that I dug this well. Therefore that place was called Beersheba, because there both of them swore an oath. So they made a covenant at Beersheba. Then Abimelech and Phicol, the commander of his army, rose up and returned to the land of the Philistines. Abraham planted a tamarisk tree in Beersheba and called there on the name of the Lord, the everlasting God. And Abraham sojourned many days in the land of the Philistines. Again, that last verse uh, is, is so important in setting the stage for this story because it, it underlines for us what Abraham's setting was. He was living his life with God in the land of the Philistines. He was living it in a pagan land. He was living it amongst people who did not believe what he believed. They had no commitment to the one God. In fact, that was pretty much unheard of in that world to only worship one God. They were people who were confused spiritually and no doubt lived very worldly lives. But I want you to notice the, the influence that Abraham had amongst them. These people knew there was something unique about Abraham, right? In fact, this man Abimelech, well, that, that Abraham was dealing with on this occasion, he said, God is with you in all that you do. That's sort of an amazing testimony coming from this pagan. You know, the man Abimelech may not have known much at all about the one God, but he knew whoever it was was with Abraham. He knew Abraham was blessed and protected by this God. He knew Abraham was in a relationship with this God and that it was important to him. So Abraham was not hiding in his tent, was he? Abraham was not content to just keep his faith within his family, within his clan, his small group. Abraham was on this lifelong mission from God. He had been called into God's service and he had answered that call. He moved uh, where God wanted him to move. He did what God wanted him to do. He lived how God wanted him to live and God blessed him. And he didn't do this to be seen of men, but men saw him. You know, people saw him and they were influenced by him. People knew God was with him. Why? By looking, by observation. Abraham was not hiding from his world. I want us to think about this. You know, it is all too easy to become a Jonah rather than an Abraham. And I'm afraid that a lot of believers have done just that. Uh, you remember Jonah, right? In his story, the reluctant prophet. God sends him to preach repentance to wicked Nineveh, the great city of the Assyrians. And all Jonah wanted to do was run and hide. And, and then... Once he was forced to go, and that's the interesting part of the story, how God forces him. But once he was forced to go, all he wanted to do was preach hellfire and, and damnation to these people that he really hated. Abraham, on the other hand, lived his life amongst wicked and sinful people, and he made an impression, a godly impression. Does that mean that he converted everybody? No. Likely very few. But people like Abimelech and like Phicol, the commander of his army, and others, they at least knew that there had been a man of God amongst them. And, you know, thinking back to Jonah, if Jonah had had his way, Nineveh would never have heard of God 
compare the two. And, and think of this, we really have to choose what example we'll follow as we live in this world, as we live in a lot of ways in Nineveh or in the land of the Philistines. Now, it's interesting to me that, uh, that all the major servants of God in the Bible are described in this same way as Abraham is here, uh, that God was with them. It's said of Isaac, go back and read Genesis 26. It's said of Jacob in chapter 30. It's said of Joseph in chapter 39. And really, all down through time, people in the world seem to be able to tell when God is with someone or not. It's even said of our Lord, uh, John chapter 3, as an example. Remember the time that Nicodemus came to Jesus at night to have a conversation with him? And one of the things that he told Jesus, he said, We know that you are from God. No one can do what you do unless God is with them. So this isn't just a, an Abraham example to follow, but this, this is being like our Lord in addition to being like the great servants of God of all time, like Abraham. And that is that people in the world, as they observe our lives amongst them, are able to come to the conclusion that God is with us. So let's go back to this story, Genesis chapter 21 for a moment. Abraham and Abimelech, they enter into this covenant, uh, this agreement, contract. It's over some pretty mundane matters. There had been a disagreement about wells and so forth. Uh, that's not uh, the most important part of this. But the agreement that they come to itself is anything but mundane. It is vital. Uh, because what Abimelech asks of Abraham is still what people in the world are expecting of us today, for the most part. And this might be the key to convincing them that God is really with us. Look at what Abimelech wants from Abraham. This is in verse 23. He says, Now therefore swear to me here by God that you will not deal falsely with me, or with my descendants, or with my posterity. But as I have dealt kindly with you, so you will deal with me and with the land where you have sojourned. You know, that, that's so clear, it'd be something you have to try to misunderstand, I guess. What, what is it that Abimelech wants from Abraham? Honest dealings, fair treatment, ethical behavior. Same thing that I believe the world still wants from us today as fellow citizens. In fact, it's the same thing that God expects. Uh, it does no good. In fact, it does great damage to claim a relationship with God and yet to be known as a cheater or a thief or a lawbreaker, or an unjust person. Abraham you know, had no problem whatsoever with this request from Abimelech to be treated fairly. And, and of course, we, we should never have a problem with that. Verse 32, it says, So they made a covenant at Beersheba. They agree to treat one another right. That's always been the essence of, of serving God, treating people right. You think about the great commands that Jesus talks about. What are they? Love God and love your neighbor. And Abraham shows us the way in this example. And then just, just one more thing. This is in verse 33. Notice what it says as this story closes. Abraham planted a, a tamarisk tree in Beersheba, and called there on the name of the Lord, the everlasting God. So, 
all throughout this this text, you've have you noticed that Abraham is putting down stakes? He he builds a well. I mean, you don't do that if you're not going to stay at least for a while. He builds a well. He plants a tree. He worships the everlasting God. Now, God had promised him. A permanent home one day. He had promised him a land, a family, a nation. And Abraham lived like he expected those promises to be fulfilled. He responded in worship. He built a life amidst a world of unbelievers. He was a man who, when the world looked at him, they knew where he stood. And who he stood with, with God. Folks, this may be one of our great challenges. In the world we live in right now, there is so much pressure for us as believers to to withdraw inside the protection of the walls of our house, our church house, to lock the world out because it's threatening. We don't want people up in our face, do we? There are threats. And the pressure is for us to withdraw in in the, the terms of Abraham, to stay in our tent. If Abraham had done this, these people would never have known that there is one God. And folks, we've got to be able to stand, to live, put down stakes, to live amongst a world that doesn't agree with us, to take a stand, not in a militant way, but in a way where we love God and we love others. So people will know that there is a, a God. And we may be persecuted for it. We've talked for years that one day there may be persecution. It's here. We may be sort of surprised at the form it's taken, but it is here. Are we willing to stand up to be seen and heard in this culture that is attacking? Will we be Jonah? Or will we be Abraham? God was with Abraham and blessed him. It showed and everybody could see it. I I just challenge us to to live like Abraham, even if it's in a, a land of unbelievers. Live for all to see. Live so they will know that God is with you. Let's pray. this, but there's all kinds of pressure to not do it, to withdraw, to hide, to stay in just safe places. Give us boldness and courage. Be with us and show us the way. And thank you for your love and for the fact that your son came to die for us. He didn't stay cloistered in heaven, but he came here and went through all that meant. Bless us today. Thank you for the opportunity to worship you and remember your son. We pray in his name. Amen.